haven't done this in a while. Good morning, <laughs> and uh, welcome to this hearing to examine our options for regulatory reform. Uh, that has been uh, something this subcommittee has worked on. Uh, Mr. Melberth, you, your organization has played an important role as well. Uh, today's discussion is a sequel to two hearings uh, that this subcommittee held in the last Congress on the, ro on the role of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA. Uh, although rarely in the headlines, OIRA has in the last few years since its creation under President Reagan uh, quietly become the most powerful regulatory office in the federal government. Uh, this fact was highlighted when an executive order promulgated by the Bush administration, Executive Order 13422, uh, gave OIRA even greater powers, uh, powers that could be exercised behind closed doors. In changing the review process, it strengthened the influence, the executive order strengthened the influence of OIRA, uh, which is staffed mainly by economists over the final content of regulations first drafted by regulatory agencies, scientific and technical experts. Uh, the order had the effect of placing in the, ha in the hands of the president, OIRA, and a faceless political operative at each agency, power over regulatory efforts that was consistent neither with statute nor with the Constitution. This subcommittee met, uh, last met to discuss, uh, since, since we last met, uh, the regulatory landscape has changed. Uh, there's a new president, you probably read about it in the papers. Within uh, 10 days of his inauguration, President Obama uh, withdrew that executive order and gave the Office of Management and Budget, uh, a budget of which OIRA is a part, 100 days to develop a set of recommendations for a new approach to regulatory review. Uh, President Obama said that far more is now known about regulation than when the Clinton administration issued Executive Order 12866, the predecessor executive order which set out the fundamental principles and structures that currently govern regulatory review. He said that a great deal has been learned, not only about uh, when regulation is justified, but also what works and what does not. Uh, he has ordered that a successor to Executive Order 12866 be drafted. Uh, from eight points that the President directed OMB to address in his recommendations, in its recommendations, we have chosen three today. Uh, with the help of our panel of uh, experts in this topic uh, that we will explore. The one is the relationship between OIRA and the agencies. Uh, we will give special attention here to the way OIRA uses uh, or challenges scientific information. Uh, second, disclosure and transparency. Today's focus will be on the standard of transparency that should be expected of OIRA uh, and up and down the regulatory process um, in, in issuing new regulations. Uh, and third, the role of cost-benefit analysis in the regulatory process. Uh, the President's action has rekindled debate on such basic issues as the role of science and economics in regulation uh, and the role of Congress and the White House uh, in deciding how regulations are issued uh, and the discretion that the underlying law and the Constitution allows the executive branch. Uh, the Constitution does not say the President shall faithfully uh, execute the laws that he likes. From 183 responses, uh, many of them long and detailed, uh, OMB had, that, that OMB has gotten already uh, un, under that uh, proposed change in the executive order, um, it appears that the debate on how rulemaking should proceed from here uh, will be vigorous, and it should be vigorous. Uh, the questions facing the president and the nation are weighty. What kind of OIRA should we have? Uh, should it be one that, as, as uh, has often been the case, acts as a gatekeeper, uh, often in secret, hindering the regulatory process through delay and the application of extra legal criteria? Uh, or should it be one that sees itself as a partner with the agencies, uh, sharing the goal of, of timely, sensible, and effective regulation? Uh, coming up with the right answer to those questions uh, could be the difference between a government that follows the law uh, acting effectively and efficiently to protect the public's health and safety, uh, and one that cripples the ability of its own executive branch agencies to carry out the laws passed by Congress. Uh, I look forward to the testimony uh, and to the discussion following the testimony. I now rep represent, uh, recognize uh, Dr. Brown for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman. I want to congratulate you for staying within five minutes. 
So I, but as you know, I'll always... When I, when I hear congratulations, I assume it's about basketball. But <laughs> I'll always be with you uh, to take as long as you want, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Chairman Miller. I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to welcome the witnesses here today. The regulatory process is an important topic for this committee to address as regulations affect the lives of every citizen, whether it, whether it is through public health, economic stability, or public safety. Science is central to this process and provides a foundation of knowledge that informs policymakers. Unfortunately, this connection is often manipulated by those who claim their policy decisions are indisputably required by science and those who question the quality or interpretation of that science. We probably won't be able to resolve this tension today, but I hope the panelists can at least shed some light on the conflict so that future decisions are made transparently without shrouding policy in science or denigrating the findings. While science plays an enormous role in providing regulators, policymakers, and legislators with the best information possible, it does not absolve those individuals of their responsibilities to make hard choices. As Dr. Colonese points out in his testimony, quote, science speaks to what is rather than what should be, unquote. This is an extremely important concept to understand and elegantly highlights the issues we are facing today. All too often, controversies arise over issues that are not questions of science, but of policy. For example, when decisions are made based on values or ethics, this is seen as an affront to science. But it shouldn't be, as long as the decision isn't sold under the banner of science. With that in mind, I look forward to the subcommittee's third hearing on this topic. The previous two focused on President Bush's executive order 13422. This amendment to President Clinton's executive order 12866 created consternation amongst advocacy groups because, as they argued, it gave too much control over the regulatory process to the administration and would prevent agencies from protecting public health and safety. What it really did was simply require agencies to report to OIRA work that the Clinton administration had already required agencies to do and address issues that were being ignored. In the end, the consternation over this executive order was more likely about who was issuing the order rather than what it directed. Because of this, it will be interesting to see what the current administration does with the authorities it inherited from the previous administration. While President Obama rescinded ex Executive Order 13422, many of the same principles may find their way back into a new order, but probably with less outrage. Similarly, the administration recently nominated Cass Sunstein to head OIRA. His nomination has come with mixed reviews from advocacy groups because of his support for cost-benefit analysis. But this concern is far less than the previous nominees. Now, Mr. Sunstein intends to, how Mr. Sunstein intends to run OIRA will also be interesting to follow, given previous criticisms from outside groups regarding centralized authority and review. Every new administration since Reagan has chosen to organize and oversee the regulatory process differently. And this administration certainly will not be an exception. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And obviously, this committee would uh, uh, will pursue conversations with Mr. Sunstein uh, in addition to whatever he, role he may be as an advocate for uh, cost-benefit analysis. He is a distinguished legal scholar. Uh, and I hope that he would not take the view that laws passed by Congress are, can be treated by the President as free advice. Uh, I ask unanimous consent now that all additional opening statements submitted by members be included by the record. I don't know that we have any of those, but they may be. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, and I also ask unanimous consent to enter a set of documents in the record that have already been provided to the minority and without objection, so ordered. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our witnesses, uh, Dr. Rick Melberth is the Director of Regulatory Policy uh, at OMB Watch, and again, our, my office 
and this subcommittee has worked closely with OMB Watch and with Dr. Melberth uh, over time uh, on, on this specific issue. Uh, Ms. Caroline Smith DeWall is the director of the food safety program at the, Science, at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Uh, Mr. Wesley Warren is the director of programs at the National Resources Defense Council and a former associate director of natural resources, energy, and science at the OMB. And Dr. Uh, Kerry Colonizzi, Colonizzi <laughs> uh, is the director of the right. Penn Program on Regulation and the associate dean uh, and uh, Edward B. Schill's professor of law uh, at University of Pennsylvania Law School as well as professor of political science uh, at UPenn. I don't know if Edward Shills was himself a lawyer, but I think if my name was Shills, I probably would have either chosen a different pro profession or changed my name. Um, and Ms. Rena Steinzer is the Jacob A. France Research Professor of Law at the University of Maryland and the President for the Center for Progressive Reform. Uh, as our witnesses should know, you each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Uh, your written testimony will be included in the record uh, for the hearing. Uh, when you all have completed your spoken uh, testimony, we will begin with questions, and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. It's the practice of the subcommittee to receive testimony under oath. We don't really think perjury is a particular concern here, but it is our practice. Uh, do any of you uh, have any object objective to uh, taking an oath? Okay. Uh, you also have the right to be represented by counsel. Do any of you have counsel present? Okay. Well, now that you are at ease, um, if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Okay. The record will reflect that every, uh, each of the witnesses uh, did take the oath, uh, did say I do. Uh, and we will begin with Dr. Melberth. Dr. Melberth. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Brown, thank you for uh, this opportunity to present some recommendation for ways to reform the uh, regulatory process. In April 2007, OMB Watch initiated a project called Advancing the Public Interest Through Regulatory Reform, and we asked a diverse group of experts in regulatory policy and uh, policies that are highly regulated to take part in the project. Their work resulted in a report released in November 2008 that contains 49 recommendations for reforming uh, the regulatory process. While the authors of the report had varying perspectives on the issues they examined during the project, they all agreed that the current regulatory process is in need of substantial reform. I want to confine my brief remarks to one very critical area of reform discussed in the report, and that is the relationship between the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs and the federal agencies responsible for protecting the public. The relationship between OIRA and the agencies has been defined, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, by a series of executive orders that outline that regulatory process. Uh, the current executive order, 12866, is under review by President Obama, um, and they have begun that process of uh, looking at, uh, at, at re-examining uh, that executive order. The report calls for restructuring of that relationship between OIRA and the agencies, placing a greater priority on agency expertise and statutory authority. The report notes, quote, the locus of decision-making authority should reside in the federal agencies given the legal mandate to promulgate regulations, unquote. That is, the agencies should possess the decision-making authority when promulgating regulations because they, not OIRA, are given the statutory mandate from Congress. The role the authors suggest for OIRA is consistent with congressional designs for the administrative state. Congress mandates regulatory authority to the agencies, which have the expertise to address the highly complex issues that are before them. OIRA does not have this range of expertise and should not be approving or rejecting individual rules. Instead, OIRA's role should be focused on the larger picture rather than on individual rules. For example, OIRA desk officers could help facilitate comments from other agencies, convene interagency dialogue about rules in which multiple agencies have an interest, and identify government-wide management issues that may improve rulemaking. 
OIRA could turn its attention to the general performance of agencies and to coordination at the point where agencies are setting their priorities and planning their activities. This coordinating role would provide the opportunity for, for OIRA to see that agency actions are consistent with presidential policies through some mechanism like agencies' annual regulatory plans and agendas. OIRA could then identify gaps in regulatory responsibilities and hold agencies accountable for addressing those gaps. And this approach would permit the prospective coordination of actions across agencies rather than individual retrospective reviews of specific rules after an agency has expended considerable time and resources. When conflicts arise over substantive regulatory issues, for example, between the president's policies and agency actions, or between two or more agencies, then OIRA should consult with agency heads, those who have been appointed by the president and have the legal responsibility to implement Congress's mandate to Congress, a mandate to the agencies. OIRA would be able to carry out this function much more even-handedly if it were not simultaneously approving or rejecting agency rules. This changed rule recognizes that regulatory agencies are very different and have statutes that require very different things of them. OIRA cannot and should not have the expertise that resides in the agencies and therefore should not be making decisions about the content of individual rules. Lastly, Congress has established OIRA to, to administer federal information resource policies and to review agency requests to collect information from the public. The report urges the President to appoint to OIRA someone well-versed in information resource management policies. Information management is the statutory responsibility of the office. By focusing so heavily on controlling regulatory decisions, OIRA has strayed from this statutory responsibility. OIRA could help agencies accomplish their congressional mandates by carrying out its information management responsibilities in ways that do not unduly burden agencies or slow down agency efforts to collect important information. The report's 49 recommendations are aimed at creating a regulatory process that is open, inclusive, effective, and efficient. One factor critically important to reforming that process to meet these goals is a restructuring of the relationship between OIRA and the agencies and the agencies based on the, and the recognition that agencies' um, expertise and statutory authority that Congress has delegated to them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Melberth. That was very close to five minutes. Uh, Ms. Smith-DeWall. Thank you. I'll see if I can do the same. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify, uh, Chairman Miller, and also a ranking member Brown. It's, uh, it's a privilege I haven't been yet before this subcommittee. Uh, my name is Caroline Smith-DeWall. I, I direct the Food Safety Program for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Our organization was founded nearly 40 years ago and focuses primarily on nutrition and food safety. Uh, we accept no government or industry funding, so our views can be very, very independent. As one of the contributors to advancing the public interest through regulatory reform, I was privileged to work with a group of diverse regulatory experts in identifying the failures of and the fixes to the regulatory system. And we commend President Obama on his revocation of the Executive Order 13422 earlier this year. But much more remains to be done. Much of it centered on reforming the regulatory review process at OIRA's, uh, the Office of uh, Management and Budgets, OIRA. My written testimony has identified and illustrated a number of problems with OIRA's review of regulations. The meat and poultry HACCP regulations showed how science is not well advanced and public health improvements can be thwarted when regulations are tied up in multi-year regulatory reviews. This case showed that the burden of review has really provided incentives for federal agencies to find creative ways to avoid going through the OMB process. The proposed egg regulation, which has been in the works for 10 years and is supported by two separate scientific risk assessments, illustrated the problem inherent in unlimited reviews that add years to the development of a regulation. 
It also illustrated that scientific uncertainty cannot overcome the confusion of having multiple agencies in charge of food safety. The bioterrorism rules that came about after Congress enacted the Bioterrorism Act of 2002 showed that OMB reviews can open the door to industry to lobby for changes to regulations without the transparency requirements required by law for the federal agencies under the Administrative Procedures Act. This allows OMB to override policy decisions best left to the agencies. These problems did not originate in the Bush administration, nor will they necessarily disappear just by having different people in charge. Fundamental changes are needed to reduce the breadth of oversight and the time lags that result. When it comes to food safety, the goal must be a rapid-paced and flexible regulatory structure that can accommodate constantly changing science and even, on occasion, imperfect science. As regulations and policies evolve, regulators must be allowed to bring new science to bear in preventing foodborne illnesses and outbreaks. Unfortunately, the review process has become a barrier to agencies' efforts to rapidly translate new science into better regulation for protecting public health. OMB, through its lengthy reviews, has diminished the role of science in crafting federal regulations. CSPI recommends that a new executive order rewrite the OMB mandate for OIRA to accomplish the following. They should update the definition for significant rules to narrow the number of regulations requiring prior approval by OIRA and to limit the review to economic issues raised in the proposed rules. They should give OIRA a rapid time frame for review that ensures that agencies can produce time, timely federal actions to protect public health and social welfare. They should require OIRA to defer to federal agencies on the scientific and technical questions, and OIRA should operate with transparency that's comparable to that required by the federal agencies. The real costs of regulatory delay are felt by everyday Americans when they experience an avoidable foodborne illness from peanut butter or peppers, from salad makings or spices. The food industry can do better, but it needs a level playing field, and that's what regulations provide. Our nation's food safety program can also improve, but not without reform of the OMB process as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith the Wall. Mr. Warren. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller and Dr. Brown. Appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I'm Wesley Warren, Director of Programs at the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is an environmental organization composed of legal and scientific experts who represent over a million members and activists across the country who are interested in environmental protection. Just for the record, I'd like to note for Chairman Miller that I hail from North Carolina, still have family in Raleigh, and flew out of the Greensboro Airport just last night on business returning to Washington. So I send please, my regards from the state. Please feel free to mention my name to your relatives in Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to do that. So I have uh, detailed comments and recommendations in the testimony submitted for the record, but which I won't repeat. Instead, I would like to take a moment to speak to the committee to say what I think is at stake uh, in, in these issues and for these hearings. The role of science in public policy is really critical, and it's critical that we restore its integrity. That means we produce the best, policy, the best quality science, and then we put that science to the best possible use. Uh, the OMB has a tremendous, tremendously important role in this process. It's one to ensure that scientific standards have been uh, followed. But it's not the role of OIRA to substitute its scientific judgment for the judgment of the expert agencies or to dictate what scientific practices should be. That instead should be determined by independent scientific bodies like the National Academy of Science uh, and other scientific experts who generate uh, standing scientific practices. 
Why does this matter in terms of the use of policy? Regulatory policy is environmental policy. If you look at the Bush administration report on the cost and benefits of federal regulations, you'll see that environmental benefits, although there's a big range of the estimates of those benefits, on the upper end of the range have an astonishing $593 billion of benefits to the economy over a 10-year period. This was the Bush administration OMB. And that on the upper end of the range is 90% of all the benefits of social regulations that exist. Why is that? The reason is because of the tremendous number of lives that can be saved from reducing pollution, especially air pollution, and the value that society puts on that life. So when you take a body of information uh, such as this, which is generated through risk assessments by the agencies, the question is how do you put that to use in, in, uh, in policy making? And what you want to do is insulate that application of that kind of information from political manipulation. Unfortunately, we discovered under the Bush administration that it was very prone to manipulation. When the OMB would involve itself in a process, it would often add additional decisional criteria than those uh, contained in the underlying statute that Congress had enacted, uh, sometimes an unreasonable cost-benefit test. And one of the reasons they, uh, one of the ways that they set out to really tilt the scales on cost-benefit analysis was to lower the estimated value that we would put on a human life. This had an extraordinary impact on what the estimated benefits might be from regulations. And in extreme cases, uh, they would say, uh, for example, it was dubbed the senior death discount, that if older people died from air pollution because they didn't have as many years left to live, that that life wasn't worth uh, protecting as much. And uh, would, in the extreme case, reduce the value of that life from what the standard value of a human life is, which is $6.1 million, according to EPA, to as low as $130,000, depending upon how many years left the person might have to live. Uh, this had an astonishing impact on what uh, federal policy might be regarding environmental protection. So our recommendation is that it's very important now to make sure that uh, OIRA doesn't substitute its expertise on science for that of the expert agencies and doesn't impose itself in a decision-making process to add criteria that Congress did not include itself. And as a result, I will read our recommendation for OIRA, which is that uh, the government should establish written publicly available performance requirements and milestones for OIRA review of agency actions to ensure efficient and timely completion of its duties. And there should be an accountability mechanism, including transparency, to ensure that these performance standards are met. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Uh, Dr. Colonisi. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Brown, and other members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here, and I would like to talk in my remarks about the relationship between science and regulatory policy, and specifically about what science can and what science cannot uh, do when it comes to justifying good regulatory policy. Now, regulatory policy, good regulatory policy s solves problems, it aims to solve problems, and to do that and do it well, uh, regulatory decision makers need to understand the problems that they're aiming to solve as well as be able to assess how different solutions uh, to that problem might uh, fare against uh, decision-making criteria that are applicable. And to understand both the problems and the relative strengths and weaknesses of different solutions, regulators need to rely on science. Science, uh, and by that I mean the systematic inquiry of about how the world works, uh, that's needed to help us understand what's causing problems. If we don't understand that, it's harder to, harder to solve them. Science can help in identifying possible solutions. Uh, if, if there are multiple causes of a problem, then science can lead policymakers to think about different solutions aimed at the different causal pathways. And of course, science can also be very important in assessing the impacts uh, or, or projecting the Im likely impacts of different policy options. So science plays a, an important and vital role in regulatory policy, but it cannot 
do everything. First, it cannot provide the criteria for decision making. Science explains the world. It provides uh, assessments of empirical reality of what is, but doesn't provide uh, a normative judgments, doesn't help tell us how to uh, balance between different criteria uh, that, that might, whether they might be effectiveness, efficiency, equity, or other policy considerations. So science describes, it does not prescribe. However, uh, sometimes regulatory agencies tend to blur that distinction. And uh, they sometimes purport to make decisions where science has told us to go. We've listened to the science. We're doing what science tells us to do. Well, when, when they're doing that, um, uh, they are uh, making a claim that just conceptually can't be uh, sustained. In 1996, the National Research Council explained in a report that, quote, science alone can never be an adequate basis for a risk decision because decisions are ultimately public policy choices. Uh, legal scholar Wendy Wagner has sometimes referred to the overemphasis on science as a science charade. I have, in my own research, uh, chronicled in detail uh, the EPA's uh, rulemakings in the, in the 1990s, and, and they've done it again in, in, in 2006, revising air quality standards and claiming to have done so because that is where science uh, has led them. Science, again, is important, but it is not and shouldn't be used as a, a cloak for policy decision-making because in doing so, the public is not aware of the real reasons justifying uh, the fundamental policy choices. So uh, in addition, uh, sometimes the lack of transparency about the fundamental policy choices being made and the reasoning behind them could lead agencies to make inconsistent or suboptimal decisions. Uh, Congress has some options to try to address uh, this uh, problem of a science charade. Uh, they could uh, take a look at various laws that create incentives for agencies to claim science is doing more than it can do. They could also look at legislative requirements to compel agencies to clearly demarcate what science is telling them and what their public policy reasoning is. Many observers have rightfully called for enhancing uh, the soundness of the scientific basis of agency decision making, but just as there is always room for improving the quality of the science that regulatory agencies repair to, uh, there are also opportunities to enhance the quality of agencies' policy reasoning, especially in those instances where agencies misleadingly suggest that science has determined their decisions. Ms. Stanzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My testimony today makes three crucial points. First, the Obama administration and Congress should define a new mission for the regulatory czar and his staff at OIRA. The American people need more, not less, regulation on every front, from mortgage lending to workplace hazards. The regulatory SARS mission should be to rescue struggling regulatory agencies by helping them to obtain more resources and stronger legal authority. Second, I could not agree more with Rick Melber's point that OIRA should stop reviewing individual regulatory proposals. Third, OIRA must stay out of science policy. As you said, Mr. Chairman, OIRA is a small office comprised of a approximately 40 to 50 professionals, the vast majority of whom are economists. OIRA is not competent to propose science policy in the regulatory arena and should abandon this role. Regulatory reform has long been code for the unfounded allegation that agencies have run amok and are galloping across the tundra, regulating without common sense at an unaffordable cost to industry. That charge is no more credible than the allegations made shortly before the current economic crisis 
that an overweening Securities and Exchange Commission was thwarting financial institutions from bringing prosperity to the world. Rather than chiding regulators for their alleged excesses, ORIRA should be helping agencies like the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the EPA, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to produce smarter, better government. These agencies are responsible for the air we breathe and the water we drink. They police hazards in the workplace, the sale of dangerous products, the purity of our food, and the safety of our drugs over the counter and prescription. And yet, all together, these agencies account for less than 0.8% of the total federal budget. In constant dollars, their budgets are the same as they were in the mid 1980s. OIRA must use its influence to rescue these agencies by ensuring that they have adequate resources, political support, and legal authority to take decisive and timely actions against real threats, from smog to peanut butter, from toppling cranes to lead-coated toys. Under John Graham, OIRA embarked on two fundamentally misguided projects to change the way regulatory science is analyzed and used. The first involved the peer review of studies used by federal agencies to make decisions, and the second tried to mandate a one-size-fits-all risk assessment policy for the entire government. The documents were so poorly informed and extreme that they provoked a backlash of opposition from the scientific community, the public interest community, and this committee. Given this unfortunate track record, OIRA under the Obama administration must confine its supervision of government to areas within its expertise, leaving to experts such as White House science policy advisor John Holdren the difficult job of restoring the independence and integrity of science throughout the government. When Barack Obama ran for president, he defined the role of government as helping people when they cannot help themselves. He said, we don't need bigger government or smaller government. We need better government. We need a more competent government. We need a government that upholds the values we hold in common as Americans. To deliver real change, OIRA must embrace this mandate and not the false premise that its most important mission is to pre prevent regulatory agencies from interfering with business. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donner. Uh, I will now, we will now have rounds of questioning and I will begin by recognizing uh, myself. Um, with respect to the use of science in rulemaking, um, actually, uh, Dr. Colonisi's uh, statement today was very similar to what I said at our first hearing on this topic uh, two years ago. Uh, I don't think scientists uh, or scientists at agencies uh, should be platonic guardians, uh, wiser than the rest of us, uh, not motivated by unsavory political considerations or economic considerations, um, but somehow pure and, and noble um, and wise, uh, but that we needed to make sure that we had sound science, honest science that informed our decisions. After we got sound science, we still, there was still plenty of room for discussion and decision about alternatives. It's the difference between risk assessment and risk management. Uh, given that I, I don't remember the exact number, I think that there was only one or two or maybe three scientists, people who by academic background or by their profession, um, uh, by their professional lives would be considered scientists at OMB. Uh, and they were getting scientific assessment, scientific information from specialists in obscure areas from all over government. Uh, what should be the role of OIRA in reviewing scientific assessments um, that come f as part of the rulemaking from the various agencies of, of the federal government? Uh, do, we can go down the line. Dr. Melberth. 
Well, I think a more appropriate role for OIRA in that situation might be to ask questions about the process um, by which that science was generated and to ensure that agencies have um, adhered to the, to the best practices as they put them in place. Um, they may very well uh, articulate questions about the science that might be raised from other agencies and somehow coordinate that discussion among agencies. Um, but I would agree with you, OIRA does not have that expertise to be questioning an agency about the science that's being, pro being proposed. Um, there is a distinction between science and policy. Um, and they, OIRA can be in a situation to ensure that the, the process by which the information that goes into policy is sound, but they're not the ones that should be in a situation of being able to assess whether or not that science is sound. That's not their job, it's not their qualification. Any, anyone else wish to be heard? I just want to make the point that um, science is not stagnant um, and we need to progress regulations much more quickly than they are today. Um, the, the role of OIRA in, in reviewing risk assessment should be limited to none uh, in, ter in terms of making sure the risk assessment is there to support the regulation, but beyond that, they, they should have very little role. Mr. Warren. Well, I think that the key is that there's, there's different ways in which the White House could be involved in some kind of review of an agency submission. Uh, what's key is, first of all, they should not be putting any criteria forward for the decision other than what's in the underlying statute. So uh, some notion of a risk assessment requirement that's not in the statute is really not in their domain. Uh, they should also not substitute substantive uh, judgments for the substantive expertise of the agencies. They, it, they need to defer to the agencies, which really has the talent pool as well as the responsibility to sort out conflicting scientific evidence. Their role should be limited to whether they have properly observed the requirements of the underlying statute in terms of using uh, the generally accepted scientific practices. And in some ways, um, it's better for them to rely on the Office of Science and Technology Policy to defer to them even in respect to that particular judgment because that office really is more the repository of scientific expertise within the White House. Dr. Colonisi. So uh, science is all about uh, open inquiry and uh, taking, asking questions, taking a skeptical approach to things. Uh, I don't think you need an to be a science expert to ask questions. The expertise comes in answering them, but uh, OIRA, uh, which may not have the same level of expertise, the head of an agency who may not be a scientist, members of Congress who may not be scientists, it seems to me perfectly consistent with the scientific ethos as well as sound public policy making to have non-scientists who are in critical decision-making or advisory roles to be asking questions uh, of those who are the experts. And, and at the conclusion of those questions, uh, can OIRA, if, if they find themselves unpersuaded, uh, substitute their scientific judgment, again, not not about what the policy should be, but what the facts are uh, for those of scientists at at agencies. Well, I think as as has been been noted, uh, OIRA doesn't have, as a relative matter, uh, the staff to actually uh, evaluate agency science assessments uh, thoroughly. And I, uh, one response to that could be uh, to um, uh, to, to somehow ban OIRA from engaging with uh, scientific issues. Another response could be, well, maybe there should be more scientists at OIRA to give them that kind of capacity. Uh, clearly, the, the law that Congress passes delegates decision-making authority to the agencies. They are the ultimate decision-makers. Their decisions uh, will be based upon a variety of inputs, scientific, policy considers economic considerations, political considerations, conversations with White House, conversations with Congress, conversations with affected parties. Okay. Mr. I, hope, I hope both Dr. Brown and Ms. Dalkemper would note that um, 
The reason we've gone over five minutes is not my question, but the answer is Ms. Steinzer. I'll try and be really quick, um, Mr. Chairman. I think um, your question is a really interesting one, and I would only um, point out that what troubles some of us is not that um, OIRA has intruded itself in science policy, but that OIRA often ignores science. And I think the best example of that would be the mercury rulemaking, where OIRA um, had a report that had been assembled at considerable effort by the National Research Council, the gold standard for scientific agencies in our country that ratified what the agency scientists had um, said. And um, I never see anyone who opposes regulation ever mention that that report exists, including OIRA economists. So when OIRA um, it asks questions, um, too often what that sort of morphs into is the economists pushing scientists and everybody else away from the table and making the decision on very narrow economic grounds that, as um, Wesley Warren said, doesn't is not consistent with the statutes and their delegation. So I would only – the problem is not that they ask questions. The problem is that they ignore science when it's inconvenient. It goes back to uh, a phrase coined by one of my colleagues, Tom McGarrity, um, your science is bad science and my science is good science. That's unfortunately the – posture too often. My, my time has expired, but I will be similarly indulgent to the other members of the committee. Uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to say to begin with, as I'm a physician, I'm a scientist, there are some members of this whole committee that are research scientists that would argue with that statement, but I'm an applied scientist, and I started my political activism by coming to Washington to lobby about conservation, and I, as a scientist, believe that science should be a very um, integral part of the decision-making process, but I also see problems. Y'all, two of you mentioned peanut butter. We had an unfortunate incident, very unfortunate incident in, in America, a very sad incident in America, where a peanut butter plant in Blakely, Georgia, where I used to live and practice medicine, provided peanut butter to the world that was tainted with bacteria, though the regulatory process was already in place to prevent that from happening. I also see another very big danger in that we see within members of this administration, uh, high up members all the way to the secretary level, that have embraced a scientific theory of human-induced global warming, and there are thousands of scientists that refute that, that there's, and say that there are minimal, if any, human effects on global warming. Um, I'm an adherent, actually, after looking at data, that that is probably true, but I'm also, as a scientist, very open-minded. When I graduated from medical school, the things that I was taught as being absolute, scientifically proven medical facts Within five years, we were teaching absolutely the opposite. That's the reason continuing medical education is so important. And herein lies a problem. You have scientists disagreeing on an issue such as human-inducing global warming. What kind of regulatory policy and, and actually legislative policy we're going to put in place when on one hand, you have people who are, are very ardent supporters of one scientific theory when it's not proven scientifically. And then on the other hand, we have things which were universally almost adhered to where scientists says the world was flat. Now, we still have those same problems today. So how should OIR, how should the government, and how should we as legislators? look at this to put in place policy that takes all stakeholders' uh, issues, thoughts, concerns and to, to uh, bear in developing regulatory authority as well as legislative uh, authority or re legislative 
um, bills and how we pass laws. So um, it, I'm very eager to hear how we weigh all those things and not just veil it in, in the idea that science should, should be the answer to all of um, how we set these regulations, because it cannot be. Science absolutely cannot be. And um, so if you all could help us as a committee to, to see how are we going to make policy that uh, where OIRA looks at all those factors, Dr. Colonese, could you help me out? Sure. Well, uh, sometimes uh, uh, when you recognize that science is separate from policy making, even though it's integral to it, uh, you can begin to recognize that sometimes uh, the best and the most justified policy choices are ones that require action even in the face of a tremendous amount of scientific uncertainty. So even though we may not have full answers to all the relevant questions that science could answer about climate change, it may be that policy is justified. Uh, it is also the case that sometimes scientists may have a great deal of certainty about certain kinds of uh, effects in the worlds that we deem problematic, but the only way to address those would be to create perhaps more problematic effects. Uh, at some limit, this, and this is the, this is the aspiration of, of, uh, of approaching policy through a cost-benefit analysis, is to try to uh, try to take into account both the positive effects of addressing a problem and the negative effects that would come from addressing that problem, and to try to achieve the policy that maximizes as much as possible the positive effects. Science is integral to figuring out what those effects are, but it, in the end of the day, won't tell us exactly what the answer to the question of what we should do uh, must be. Thank you, Doctor. If I may, Chairman, have one more w w one more witness. You are less over your time limit than I was over my. Okay, hey, Ms. Smith. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I I think that one of the things we have to recognize is that the agencies right now are actually hesitant to bring forward regulatory solutions. Um, we have observed this. You, you made the point about the, the peanut butter plant in Georgia, and that was a tragic event for many, many people, including many of the people who work there. Um, but the, the regulatory process was not in place in that plant. The overall policy that we've been operating under in the food safety arena is one developed for the astronauts, really, that, that does require companies themselves to identify hazards in their products, really to apply science to their process, and to find ways to, to resolve it. That system was not mandated for, for that peanut butter facility or any other. Um, it is required only for a few types of food products in the U.S., even though it's generally understood by the industry that this is the appropriate tool to use to manage food safety. So I, ju I just would urge you that um, hesitation in even beginning the regulatory process is something that we've observed with the food safety, and there are two agencies that are principally involved in food safety. And secondly, that the standards that they try to use, what we call performance standards, aren't being modernized, aren't being updated, and that's where the science really comes in. So I think one approach that's being considered is whether the policy and the science should somehow be decoupled so that the science can be updated much more rapidly. Regulations today are taking about five years to get through the process at OMB. It's really too long if you're trying to protect public health. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Smith. Well, uh, I want to disagree with you, though, because the, the problem with the peanut butter plant was that the regulations and the oversight to those regulations just weren't applied by the by the um, by our own state government, and and it, it was tragic, and and unfortunately, our our Department of Agriculture just didn't do a good job on that. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Dalkepper. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For a generous five minutes. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank the panel for coming today and speaking on this very important topic. Um, several of you have expressed the opinion that the regulatory agencies whose work is public health, public safety, and the environment are starved for resources and, and weakened in many other ways. So I'm asking you, what's the fix? How do we uh, have, fix this situation? And as we look at OIRA, how can we make them more of a partner to make sure that these very important uh, goals are achieved? So I'm going to ask the entire panel to uh, kind of address this. The authors of, of our report uh, indicated that one of the m most critical um, issues that need to be addressed, uh, I think the most, uh, the recommendation on which there was very little disagreement, there was very little discussion, it was just a, a, a given from the very beginning, was that agencies are underfunded and understaffed. There's been a great drain of science, um, of, of experts, of inspectors. Um, the resource base for agencies needs to be restored. And in order to do that, the authors are urged that there be some kind of assessment performed and OIRA may be the agency to be able to do this. Um, regarding agencies' statutory responsibilities and the new challenges that they're facing. So they can get some idea of what's necessary for the agencies to actually meet their missions. And then OIRA should be in place, sh should, should take the responsibility for trying to help agencies get that funding and work with the agencies to get that funding. It should not be an office that works to hinder agencies, but to help agencies. Ms. Smith, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we need to empower the agencies to start regulating. The, we have seen the costs of under-regulation in the financial sector. Those are very plain. Let me tell you, in the food sector, um, the spinach industry has still not recovered market share. It's the market share it had prior to the 2006 outbreak. Um, we've seen every time one of these major foodborne illness outbreaks occurs, it's hundreds of millions of dollars in lost profits, lost revenue to those industries involved. So not only are the costs to the consumers who get sick, the costs of hospitalization for E. coli 015787 can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it is cost to industry as well. OIRA should be empowered to look at where there is a lack of regulation. Um, we know in the food area, we've seen it repeatedly with FDA, that they just don't have the tools, its resources, its staff, but it's also a, a framework for regulation that would help to prevent these illnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warren. Excuse me. Uh, well, I want to endorse the uh, comments from the previous two panels, panelists. I want to make a broad point and a specific suggestion in response to your question. I think the broad point goes back to Dr. Brown's question, which I think is a fundamental question. Uh, how do you take action in the face of uncertainty? And the fact of the matter is we have great science in this country, but I've never met a scientist who didn't think that they could learn some more by doing some more research in their particular area, especially if they got a government grant. We're always learning more, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But we can't wait then until we know everything to act because not acting has cost for society just like overacting does. So I think in this particular care, I, although my background is in economics, uh, I think I have a legal analogy, which is government needs to act more like a civil trial where the weight of the evidence is as opposed to a criminal trial with a much higher standard. Uh, because it's wanting to uh, not have too little regulation as well as not too much regulation. So uh, my specific suggestion where OIRA is concerned is any time they put a requirement on the agencies to do more analysis, they have to make the budgetary resources available in order to do that. And remember, there's another part of OMB, which is the part that I worked in, which is the budget part. And they should really be uh, united in terms of uh, uh, making sure the resources are there to uh, to do the regulatory processes and the assessments that are required, uh, as well as overseeing the requirements. Thank you, Mr. 
Colonies. Thank you very much. Uh, the the kind of uh, assessments that Mr. Warren me just mentioned and Dr. Melberth mentioned, I mean, there are assessments that are required in the Government Performance and Results Act, and OMB on the budget side has put in place a part, uh, a, a review process called PART uh, that's been in place to assess how agencies are doing. There are those processes in place. I'm not sure OIRA, given its uh, staff size and, and its his role on the management, the M part of OMB uh, being separate from the budget, is really positioned well to uh, to address the resource uh, demands that agencies have. Uh, as to your question about whether OIRA can be more of a partner rather than, I gather, an opponent to regulatory agencies, I think um, uh, it's actually pretty hard to to create that kind of partnership relationship by just changing words in an executive order. Uh, so who heads that agency uh, and the administration in which that agency serves is going to be very important. I will say lastly uh, in, on this question of being a partner, or being an obstruction, there are at least, uh, well, there are four major social science studies uh, to date that I'm aware of uh, that have examined the the extent to which OIRA contributes to delay in the regulatory process. And the results across those studies consistently have failed to find any systematic uh, general pattern of delay that's caused by OIRA. Some of these studies actually indicate that rules that go up to OIRA are completed in a faster <laughs> manner than rules that don't. Um. I really appreciate your question, and I have a very specific recommendation. Um, the performance assessments and rating tool, the PART tool, um, is actually located in the management section of OMB, not at OIRA. But it's not in the budget section, it's in the management section. Um, I think that the shortfalls in funding are so severe that they cripple any effort to perform um, on statutory mandates and that it would be extremely useful if this part tool would be used to work with the agencies to line up all the things they're required to do by statute and the amount of resources they have and would compare what they would need to complete all those mandates. This is the only way I think we will ever be able to give you the tools, you Congress the tools, to either give them more money so they're not sued constantly for missing deadlines and not putting rules out on time, um, or repeal the mandates, in which case I suspect we would have quite a lively debate on some of the health and safety mandates. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is that my testimony cites uh, studies, empirical studies that have been done that show that OIRA's overwhelming influence is to weaken regulatory protections. There are several academics that have written studies that show that, and I'd urge the committee to take a look at that. It, it, the rulemaking process takes a long time for a lot of reasons, but the overwhelming trend when OIRA gets its hands on something is it, at least um, in the past many years, except perhaps during the Clinton administration, has been to weaken the regulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you, panel, for specific suggestions. I appreciate that, and, and thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Dal Kemper. I, I now recognize myself for a second round of questions. Uh, there's a Woody Allen movie, I think the name is Sleeper, that is set several centuries into the future. Uh, and there is a scene in the movie where a character is distraught and the Woody Allen character, uh, the, the character played by Woody Allen, uh, hands the character or the other character, the distraught character, a cigarette and says, here, smoke this cigarette. Scientific research has proven that tobacco is one of the best things for you. Um, I think we all recognize that science uh, can change, does change. Uh, people in politics, uh, we have now made flip-flopping the cardinal political sin. And it is frequently said of politicians that they are frequently wrong but never in doubt. Scientists are sometimes wrong but always uh, in doubt. 
uh, and we want to have a rulemaking procedure that recognizes the possibility that science is is evolving, and, but we need to make decisions based upon the science that exists now. Um, the hearings that this committee held on the executive order uh, was not the only time that, that uh, the role of OIRA came to our attention. Uh, there is a statutory requirement to create uh, in, e in EPA uh, what is called the in Integrated Risk Information System. It is simply supposed to be a registry of chemicals that may have some health consequences. Uh, it, is not, it is not risk management. It is risk assessment. What do we think these chemicals do to you? Uh, and it, uh, there has been a great deal of procedure involved in those determinations, and uh, it is now down to two assessments a year when 600 new chemicals are coming onto the market every year, coming into, into, current, into, into widespread commercial use every year. Um, and, and, and chemicals that, like TCE and formaldehyde have been tied up for 20 years uh, in the assessment process. Um, Mr. Whitaker has a slide. This is one, was one of my favorite moments in the last two years, in the last Congress. This is the procedure. These are actually um, diagrams prepared by EPA. This was the procedure in effect from 2004 and 2000 until April of 2008. Um, and the last head of, of OIRA, Susan Dudley, uh, testified that the, one of the reasons for the slow um, um, rate at which new chemicals made it onto the IRS list, new assessments made on the IRS list, was that this was too complicated. So she developed a streamlined procedure, which Mr. Whitaker can now show the streamlined procedure. This was post -10, April 10, 2008. Okay, can we show again quickly the, the complicated procedure? Mr. Whitaker? It's good I get the mouse over there. Sorry. That's, that was complicated. Now show simplified. No, no. Simplified. Yes, that was simplified. Um, I, well, I've cited Woody Allen. There was also a Chico Marx line, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Um, how can one of, one of President Obama's directives to OMB and directing and developing a new executive order is come up with something more streamlined? doesn't take us long. Um, what can we do to make sure that that takes into account the right considerations uh, but how can we structure OIRA's participation uh, that makes a review process timely, uh, that makes it happen when it needs to happen? Uh, Dr. Melberth. Well, I think the IRIS example is an excellent one to use. One of the one this this is an illustration of one of the ways, um, or one of the reasons why OIRA should not be involved in scientific information. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. The IRIS process is an assessment. It's risk assessment. It's not at all management. This is collecting critical information. It's removed from the policy decision about what do you do when you have this information. What what steps should we take now once we know how damaging a, a certain chemical might be. This process, the, the, the quote-unquote simplified process that, uh, that OIRA put in place with EPA's help uh, in 2008, um, changes that process so not only is it more complicated in, in this, but our understanding of it is it actually gives certain agencies affected by the potential policy outcome of a profile of a chemical the right to veto whether or not that assessment gets finished, whether or not the IRIS office in EPA actually does their work. So that's OIRA interference in the generation of information, the generation of science, not in the policy. That's not a policy-related decision that has nothing to do with presidential priorities or consistent uh, achieving consistency with presidential pro policies. It's merely scientific information. That's not an appropriate role for OIRA. That's the kind of thing I think that an executive order could very clearly um, be worded clearly to separate OIRA from that kind of process, place those kinds of responsibilities for reviewing those processes in some other 
agency, but certainly not an OIRA. We haven't called for votes. It, it'll 15 minutes, it doesn't take us that long to get there, and they always hold it open well beyond that. But could each of you give a, like, two-sentence answer? Anyone who wishes to be heard, you don't have to be heard on every question. Um, I just want to point out that uh, OIRA's role really should be shifted to prospective before the rules and, and really considering how rules, how risk assessments can be standardized across the government. Um, at that point, um, their review of, of the actual regulation should be limited to, to only very large rules. Very, very quickly. Mr. Warren. Well, I think it's two issues. One is OIRA's role should be limited to its domain, and then whatever its domain for reviews are, it should have re performance requirements that are very clear, very explicit, so that you don't have vague conversations and, and asking endless asking of questions and uh, never coming to a conclusion. All agencies have performance requirements under the Government Performance Review Act. OIRA should have very specific ones in this area. Dr. Colonisi. I would just caution about making too much about the number of steps in any procedural map. Uh, it's not just the number of steps, but how long it takes to get through them, and that can often be a function of the will or the motivation of the regulator or the decision maker. Uh, this is the, the simplified system has not proven to be a quick system. Uh, right. And the, am I, Don, sir. All right, well, I, I understand your yeah. point, but. But the experience under these two reviews is consistent with how they appear, the, the optics of them. Uh, Ms. Steinzer. OIRA should stop reviewing individual rules, and OIRA should stop serving as a representative of aggrieved industries and agencies like the Department of Defense in obstructing IRIS numbers from coming out. Marvelously succinct. Uh, Ms. Dr. Brown, uh, I, think, I think if we finish this round of questioning from Dr. Brown, that may be enough for the day, given that we are being called to votes. Thank you, Chairman. Very quickly, uh, Justice Breyer has noted that civil servants in some regulatory agencies may tend to, quote, have tunnel vision, unquote, and fail to consider the broader impacts of regulatory proposals. I'd like to ask the panel very quickly, yes or no, and if you want to expound on that slightly, do you think centralized review of records is ever appropriate? Dr. Melvin? I'm sorry, I can't give a yes or no answer to that because it depends on what you mean by that review. If it's a review, as I had outlined in my comments, where it's much more of a prospective review and on planning issues, that may be appropriate. The individual review of rules is, in our opinion, inappropriate. Okay, Ms. smith do. Thank you. Any review that is delaying the implementation, the development of health and safety regulations needs to be modified so it stops delaying those needed rules. Mr. Warren. Yes, there can be uh, cases in which this uh, makes sense. Other agencies have expertise and statutory authorities that may need to be harmonized. But any such interaction needs to be made part of the public record and transparently documented so that people can see what's going on. Uh, uh, yes, easy. certainly uh, review of individual rules is appropriate, whether by the president or whether by the members of a congressional committee. Thank you. The censor. The president has review capacity, and that's the political appointees who serve at all the agencies. That's how he controls those agencies, and it really is not necessary or warranted to have OIRA economists second-guessing those appointees. Okay, that brings up a whole other question, but did we, we um, we're very close on the vote. We have just less than 10 minutes now. One. Quick question, too, is President Bush largely adopted President Clinton's executive order. Are there any parts of President Bush's executive order 13422 that should be kept by the Obama administration? Let's start on the other end. The sense of yes. No. Completely throw them all away and not have any. 13422, uh, which is the one, yes. I, I agree with the Obama administration, strongly support their effort to um, drop that executive order. Well, that's normal that that's rewritten every, every 
administration, Dr. Cullen, easy. Well, I think the, uh, the, the Bush amendments to the executive order were largely symbolic through and through. Uh, I don't think that uh, the rescinding it has changed much. Uh, I don't think actually having approved it changed much. Perhaps the biggest uh, change that it made was providing some information to OIRA about guidance documents that agencies are contemplating. And uh, that is certainly worth uh, investigating further. Mr. Warren. No, I wouldn't keep any of the elements. I would start with the Clinton administration executive order and uh, revise from there. I would agree with Mr. Warren. And I would agree with that as well. Just in sake of time, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, just submit the rest of the questions uh, as written I, questions. I have a great many questions as well, but we do have time for Ms. Dalkemper to ask some. Uh, we have seven minutes left on the vote. Um, I'll ask a quick question and ask for just a quick answer from each of you. To what extent should OIRA's internal communications and its communications with agencies be made public? I'll start. We argue that they all should all be made public. All those communications should become part of the, part of the rulemaking docket. Uh, we agree with that, and in addition, um, they should have transcripts of meetings with in regulated industry on any uh, rule before them. We need much greater transparency in this area, both interactions with outside parties and any exchanges between OMB, other agencies, and the agency in question that submitted the proposal. Uh, the trend has been toward greater transparency over time. Uh, I, 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 how much more, whether it should be transcripts, whether we should have hidden cameras uh, is not a question. I have a research background or a basis for opining. I agree with the first three panelists. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Dalkemper. Um, we will return to, to this issue. We, this is an issue on which we will continue to exercise our oversight responsibilities. Um, uh, particularly, I think other committees will as well. Uh, the first hearing, uh, the first the executive order, I think, provoked hearings both in this subcommittee and in the administrative law subcommittee of the uh, ju uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, so we will return and continue to pay particular attention to how scientific information is used in rulemaking. Um, but uh, I think for today, I want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, I know that Dr. Colonisi mentioned a study, uh, not, not in his prepared testimony, but an answer to a question, in response to a question. Uh, if any of you have re referred to a study, if you could provide those to the committee and we could include it in the record, that would be helpful. Um, Dr. Brown. Mr. Chairman, if you yield just a second, I, uh, I appreciate us coming back and reviewing this, and I particularly want to see once the Obama executive order comes out to for us to look at, at the, the principles that he puts forth in his executive order, and I think we need to look at that very closely. I agree. Uh, the witnesses are now excused, and the hearing is, is adjourned. Thank you very much for being here.